Namaste and greeting. I, Zubia Moin, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we are gathered for a panel discussion on the topic forfeited before realizing demographic dividends potential and reality in India. This deliberation is a part of the state of population and development, hashtag population and development series organized by the Empire Center for Human Dignity and Development. As the moderator for the series, we have Mr. Devender Singh, Global Studies Program, University of Freiburg, Germany and visiting senior fellow MP. We welcome you, sir. We are elated to welcome our distinguished panelists for today's discussion. Professor Jayan Jose Thomas, Professor of Economics, Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Welcome, sir. Dr. Neha Jain, Assistant Professor of Economics, Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. We welcome you, ma'am. We are also grateful to have Professor P.M. Kulkarni, demographer, retired professor of population studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and Professor Santosh Mehrota, visiting professor, Center for Development Studies, University of Bath, UK, and retired professor, JNU. A very warm welcome to all of you. Now, I would like to invite Devinder Singh sir to initiate the discussion and invite our panelists. We look forward to learning from this team gathering. Thank you. Sir, your mic is off. Thank you very much, Jubia, for a lovely introduction to the panelists. It's a very distinguished panel which we have, and we are going to discuss a very important topic, uh, which was in news for sometime, but now it's losing the space in uh, public discourse. I just, I'll make some brief introductory comments and then we are going to invite the panelists. Uh, <clears throat> demographic dividend, if we look at it, it's a demographic concept as much as it's an economic and social concept. Very simply put, it's a demographic condition when dependency ratio is low and working age ratio is high. And why it happens? Because more, there are more people in working age, there are more earnings and savings, both at the individual level and uh, society, uh, society level. That's why it's called dividend. And which leads to individual as well as nation's economic prosperity. There are high investment by families in the health and uh, well-being of their children and other and other family member, as well as by society as a country uh, in social sector, which leads to a virtuous cycle of uh, economic development and prosperity. And what is the potential and availability? Different studies have shown that in India, the demographic dividend is available for a longer duration like we can say for 50 years, uh, but it is staggered. And what I mean by being a staggered that it is not happening. The demographic transition is taking place at different pace in different states. So if the demographic dividend window is open in some states, it might be closing in other states. And because it's staggered, it's not happening at one point in the whole country. So I say it, the, it, demographic dividend availability is benign. The working age ratio is not very high in, in India. When we look at the highest working age ratio that occurs in India between 2020 and 2040, that's, so the best period for demographic dividend are those years. But there is a case there. First of all, demographic dividends is not a given. It has to be realized. And as I said, the peak years are 2020 to 2040, but the preparation has to be done in advance, not when it's already available. 
Like for example, maximum number of people were entering in the labor force were in the decades of 2001 to 2011 and 2011 to 21. So maximum number of people have already entered in the labor, labor force. To realize the demographic dividend, right policies and programs along with commensurate focus on specific areas and specific population groups and investments have to be made. So those are the right conditions we need to have. Some of the right conditions, we can say that the population has to be healthy, especially the women and children. And young people have to be educated, especially the girls. The workforce has to be skilled. And the economy has to be a high performing economy, able to generate required number of high quality jobs. And people have to be in gainful employment. Old people had retired to have pensions and savings. So these are some of the conditions which are there. And uh, in this discussion, panel discussion, what I have visualized that we are going to have uh, two focus. One, in the first installment, I'm going to invite Professor Kulkarni and uh, Dr. Neha to highlight, uh, to make us understand what are the demographic aspects of uh, uh, demographic dividend. In the second, I'll invite Professor Math Marotra and Professor Jane Thomas to see uh, what is the reality or different, like what the conditions, some of the conditions which I have highlighted here, how we have prepared, how we have done, and what, what, what is the scenario, overall scenario of uh, uh, realizing demographic dividend in India? Uh, be, without wasting much time, I'm going to invite Professor Kulkarni to uh, share his views on the availability and potential of demographic dividend in India. Sir. Thank you, Devender, and thanks to IMPRI for the kind invitation. Uh, I think Devender has covered some of the basic issues in the introductory remarks. And broadly over the last few years, there has been so much discussion on demographic dividend that the essential points in it are fairly known. But just to make a beginning, uh, the work of several analysts on the East Asian tigers, looking at the growth of East Asian tigers, identified a demographic factor, namely a rise in the share of working age population as one of the contributors to the economic growth of these countries. And following that, the work by Bloom and others went through this comprehensively and labeled this phenomenon as the demographic dividend and showed that this is available for a period of time, what is called the window of demographic opportunity. Essentially, why does it occur? A steep fertility decline leads to lower young age population than what would have been in the absence of this decline, thereby reducing the share of this component of dependent population, the young dependent population, and consequent rise in the share of the working age population. And over time, the share of working age population, old age population increases, and that of working age falls. Thus, the dividend is no longer available after this period of window of demography. The window closes. One thing to be noted is this dividend is not planned. It is not the goal of a population policy as such. However, a neo Malthusian policy of lowering fertility can result in a dividend if the fertility decline is steep enough, sharp enough. And fertility decline without a population policy would also have the same results. It is essentially fertility decline contributing to the, this favorable situation, potentially favorable situation. And of course, as mentioned, this is an opportunity and can be beneficial if labor force participation and productivity of labor are high. And therefore, this opportunity has to be utilized. The dividend has to be harvested. There is a second dividend coming after it, but I will not get into it because I'm not an economist and economists are better equipped to examine and deal with the second dividend that comes after some time. But when does a dividend accrue? When do we say share of working age population is high? 
assuming 15 to 64 as working ages, which is normally taken in most of the discussions. I will come to that later. If this share is relatively high at a time point, we will say the window of demography opportunity is open. In the stationary population with relatively low mortality, this share is 65 to 67 percent in the 15 to 16 age group. And as a result, the equivalent dependency ratio is about 50 to 53 percent. So we can say that when dependency ratio is less than this, the conditions are favorable and we are in a situation of demographic dividend. Of course, instead of dependency ratio, one can use potential supply ratio or a weighted dependency ratio, but the results would be fairly similar minor differences, not substantially. What is the situation for India? It is now well known that India has experienced fertility decline and fertility reached replacement level from the evidence we have by around 2017. The age distribution is changing and demographic dividend has begun to accrue now. In order to see when the dividend begins or when it is likely to end, we need population estimates and projections by age distribution of the population. And the UN population estimates, UN's median projection shows, you can have the slide now, please, for India. Can we have the slide, please? Which shows. Okay, yeah, thank you. Now, this slide shows the orange color or whatever it is, is for India. And you can say India dependency ratio has fallen below the cutoff point, which is suggested. I, I suggested a cutoff point like 50% already, just around 2016-17. And it will be below the cutoff point until late 2050s or 2060. So there will be dividend for quite some time. However, notice that the India curve is only slightly below the cutoff point, which means the dependency ratio would be low, but not very low. To show contrast, the curve for China has also been shown on the same graph. As we know, China began to experience fertility decline before India, and the decline was very sharp in 1970s and 80s. A result of that is China began to experience, get into dividend, quite early, as we can see in the graph, even before 2000. Second thing, Chinese dependency ratio has fallen quite low, much below 50. It went to around 37% or so, which is a very, very favorable situation. So China is ahead in demographic trend, dividend, and also the extent of dividend, if we could see how low is the dependence ratio, is very high in China and not so much in India. In India, one can say, the dividend is more or less moderate and not very high. And basically what we see for China would be similar for South Korea, Taiwan, but even before China did, because those are the East Asian countries which have shown growth. Of course, why 50 to 64? This is something that could be questioned. And analysts use different age groups. I prefer 20 to 64 because 15 is, appears to be too early, given even our laws and so on. So for six, 20 to 64, what is the picture? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. And we can see picture is more or less similar with small variations in timings and so on. India, you can say, has already begun to draw dividend. Here, the cutoff is not 50% because now we are taking age group 20 to 64. So dependency ratio below 70% would be considered advantageous. For India, it comes to, be, happens around 2018-20. And it continues till about 2070. So India would get a dividend for the next 20, 45, 50 years or so. Again, it would be much smaller than what China has already got because China has already derived substantial dividend. Though China would lose the dividend by 2040 within the next 20 years, it has already benefited a lot. How well it has been harvested is a different matter. I don't want to get into that. But anyway, there has been an advantage to China, both in terms of time, timing is early, and also extent, since the dependency ratio has gone substantially low. For this age group, it went down to 53%, much below the cutoff, suggested cutoff of 75%. Whereas for India, it will not go 
down to even 60 percent and therefore again it will be a moderate dividend for india not very high nothing really to get very excited about so there is dividend but this is a picture for india as devender mentioned at the beginning things are staggered in india the de demographic transition has been not been uniform across india it has been spatially staggered some states are well ahead in transition and some states are lagging some states reached low fertility replacement level fertility 20 years ago and some may take 10 15 more years to do so and therefore the extent of dividend and the timing of dividend is bound to vary across states. And for that, we need state level projections. The UN does not give state level projections. India's Registrar General's Office has a committee who provide projections, but only up to 2036. But we need to go, as we say, beyond 2036, because the dividend, dividend is likely to continue, we're con likely to gain dividend even beyond 2036. And therefore, I have did projections up to 2100 for large states of India, wherever it was possible. And those results are presented in the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, instead of presenting results for each states, because that would really make the figure very messy, I tried to divide it into regions. Broadly, they, each region has similar demographic characteristics. The southern states, the five southern states, which began to draw dividend early because their fertility decline was much earlier than the rest of the country. And we can say they entered into phase of division even before dividend, even before 2010. However, they will lose the dividend before others. And by 2060, they will lose the dividend. They will get a peak dividend by 2030 or, or so. 2030 or so. So they are now more or less at the peak dividend level, lowest dependency ratio. At the other extreme are the central states, UP, Bihar, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, where which have been lagging in demographic transition, they have not yet begun to gain demographic dividend. They will probably do so in the next few years, begin to gain dividend, and that dividend will continue for a long time. The second thing for these states, again, the lowest level of dependency ratio, which we can say is the peak of the dividend, the lowest dependency ratio is a point where we get the highest potential dividend. There, that is also not as low as in the case of some of the southern states. The western states and northwestern states, especially Punjab, Himachal Pradesh, Jammu Kashmir, they will also be very, they're also very close to the southern states. The graph shows if one can separate these points. Followed by the eastern states, the orange curve is for India and the one figures which are at the top at the beginning, they are for the south centrals. So we can say as some states get into dividend, some states have begun to lose dividend and over time they will lose dividend. When Uttar Pradesh, Bihar would be getting high dividend, southern states would be losing dividend, they would be getting out of the dividend phase. And as a result, at any given time point, the dividend for India as a whole would not be very large. It would not be as happened in China, South Korea, Taiwan, or Singapore. And therefore, India is not as favorably placed as this state, other states because the fertility decline has not been steep, and that is because the fertility decline has not been uniform over the states in terms of time. It has staggered, shifting, and so on. Now, what does this tell us, actually? We can look at phases of dividend. You know, Since the dividend declines and increases and so on, dependency ratio declines and then increases. Next graph, please. I have tried to put it in the... Uh, somehow framework of phases. The first phase is a phase where dependency ratio is declining, but not low enough to be called a dividend. It has not yet reached that level of 75%. It is still above that. The darker, blacker part is the one where we have begun to gain dividend and it is increasing. The greener part is the one where we are still getting dividend, dependency ratio is low, but now the dependency ratio is slightly rising. So gradually we are losing dividend. And the yellow portion is the one where 
we are out of the dividend phase. Dependency ratio is not now low enough. It has fairly high. And we can see now I have presented for states because it was possible to do so. And we can see southern states, etc., and Delhi, of course, began to gain dividend very early. They will also lose dividend before other states. The northeastern, north central states will begin to gain dividend late. They have not yet begun to gain dividend, but they will continue to gain. And at any point in time, therefore, we would not really have dividend. And states will be in different phases of transition. Now, what are the implications in terms of labor force? Next, please. If we look at numbers, still now we are looking at shares, but because dividend really comes from shares and not the number. Number of workers has been, working age population has been increasing even in the past, but dividend was not there. However, when uh, it Professor comes, Kulkani, may I, if, I, if you don't mind, if I could yes. just seek a clarification about your previous slide. Yes, okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry for interrupting. Oh, not at uh, all, not at all. Uh, I, uh, yeah. uh, with uh, your permission. I just yes. wanted to be clear about this phase one, two, three, and four. Yes. How yes. exactly yes. are you doing? Okay. Phase one is not a dividend phase. Phase one is pre-dividend phase. Okay. Where dependency ratio is declining, but it has not re reached low enough to be called dividend. Mm. In this case, I have taken 75% of cutoff. One could use different cutoffs. Mm. So it is declining. Things are improving. Share of working age population is increasing, even declining, but it is not low enough. We can say we are in a dividend position. The dark one is it is low enough and it is uh, uh, reducing further. Therefore, dividend has begun to accrue and dividend is increasing during this dark phase. The greenish phase is ratio is still low. Dependency ratio is still low, but gradually it is increasing in the greenish phase. And in the yellow, the dividend has now crossed the cutoff point. So we no longer get dividend. So the first, the gray and yellow are pre and post dividend phases. The black and green are dividend phases where div black dividend is increasing or intensifying, you could say. And green, the intensity is losing, yet we are in a favorable position. Now, the point where we move from black to green is a point where dividend is the highest or dependency ratio is the lowest. We reach the bottom of that. So this is broadly uh, the way it is done. Many people consider, some analysts have seen, the end of black, that is where de dependency ratio is the lowest, as the end of dividend. But I don't agree with that because even after that, dependency ratio is low, but not the lowest. So there... I have therefore divided this into phases like that. The middle two are dividend phases. The uh, first and the last are pre and post dividend phases. Is that, uh, am I clear? Yeah. Yes, thank you very okay. much. Yes. Okay, yeah, please go. Sorry, I, uh, I, I, I should have made it clear. Okay, please go ahead. Next slide, please. Yeah. Now, this shows the numbers rather than shares. I'm changing this slightly because here we require that. And what we see is, increase, what I showed here are increases in actual number of working age population during 2001 to 31, 31 to 61, and after 60. And we can see that 2001 to 31, that is increasing in almost all the states, the blue color bars. The share of working age population is increasing. We are getting dividend and dividend is by and large increasing in all the states. The orange colored ones are the increase from 2031 to 61. And we can see for most states, there is no increase. There is in fact decrease. The values are negative for most states, which are ahead in fertility transition, which are at middle level. Except for states like Bihar, MP, UP. These are the states which have been lagging in transition, will show increases in size of working age population even after 31. So they will gain more potential workers, not necessarily workers, potential workers. And after 2061, according to the projections, there will be no increase in the number of working age population. That number would decline after 2061. In fact, for India, various projections have showed that India would reach a peak population around 2060, and then population will decline, as will working age population, and old age population would increase. 
So there will be this imbalance now, especially after 2031. Some states will have large increases in working age population, and some states will lose working age population. And this has now implications. So I, that's my last slide. So I was basically mentioning what this means. It means that after 2031, there could be massive migration from some states to other states, and it is massive. Please note that these numbers are in millions of population. And this massive migration is something, if one can utilize this thing and allow this or facilitate this massive migration, one can still harvest dividend in a certain way because the staggered dividend, already Southern states have got it, other states have not got it, they will get it. If migration can be, is labor migration is possible, this is something that can be done, though it is not easy. And this is the base thing I would like to close upon that because of the spatial variations, India would not achieve as high a dividend as, say, China at any time. This seems like a relative disadvantage, but this moderate dividend lasting for a long period could allow the economy to accommodate the rising working age population in labor force. However, this rising working age population in labor force, in work, population in working ages, varies from state to state. Some states would have it and some states would not have it. And this means this would be possible if one can facilitate or one can foresee large labor migration from one region to another, one state to another. However, there is a problem with it. We know already that long distance and interstate migrants face family separation, language barriers, difficulties in accessing welfare services, including health education, and there is political resistance to immigration in various areas, especially when the immigration is massive. So true, India cannot get as much dividend as China did. It can only be moderate. And this moderate also, if it is to be utilized properly, there should be a way to facilitate interstate migration smoothly without many issues. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kulkarni. Uh, now I'll invite uh, Dr. Neha to uh, continue the discussion on demographic side, as well as uh, to uh, let us know from the uh, recent paper also of the economic implication which they have uh, derived based on regression analysis. Uh, I'm not able to share my screen. Because... Now please try again. Yes, you can expand it now. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir, and Indri for inviting this talk. So as Professor PM Kulkarni has already pointed out the potential of demographic dividend for India. And there are two phases of dividend, like the first phase, like when a country has a higher share of working age population relative to the dependents, but this phase is just transitory in nature and it vanishes over time, like due to changes further declining fertility, improvement in adult mortality, and this leads to the realization of the second demographic dividend. So we can say that the first dividend and second dividend are just two sides of the same coin. Now, uh, coming to the empirical evidences from some of our recent paper, what we can figure out like when the window of opportunity has actually started for India. This is the first question which we are going to address. So we can see, yes, so we can see that if the working age population has a significant impact on per capita income of different states, here the sample size is for 25 states of India, for the time period 1981 to 2015-16. So we can find that working age share has a significant impact on the per capita income level during the period 2001-5 and the effect has got strengthened in the year 2011 to 15. 
which is in line with other findings also controlling for all the socio economic correlates of growth for indian states now if we want to find out as we know that working age share alone cannot contribute to economic growth it needs right kind of policy environment so if we channelize these working age population impact on per capita income through education health employment opportunities lower gender bias and availability of good infrastructure so if we use all of these as instrument as channels through which the working age share has a significant impact on per capita income so yes it is a it is very important like 1% rise in the working age population can lead to up to 5.9 percentage of the growth in per capita income across states over time controlling all other socio economic correlates next we know that economic inequality has increased especially after uh, economic liberalization of 90s and different states are having different level of per capita income so if we want to find out that what is the contribution of working age share across different states per capita income inequality so by using the regression based inequality decomposition model we can find out that around 1/4 of the per capita income inequality across states over time is contributed by the working age share variations in working age share across states over time like as professor pm kulkarni has already pointed out that different states are having different fertility trans transactions so that transitions are actually leading to differentiations in their per capita income level so therefore this slide is reassuring the significance of focusing on working age share to promote equality across states over time next we know that working age share if provided gainful employment opportunities can lead to higher savings which is ultimately leading to the possibility of second demographic dividend so if we want to find out like what is the impact of working age share on the private savings of indian states again state level analysis is done for the period 2001 to 19 over time so this highlights that when the working age share is again supported by favorable socio economic policy environment such as education healthy working age population higher level of development and gender equity then it again contributes to higher private savings which is a manifestation of realization of second demographic dividend provided right social policy environment is in place now coming to the effective demographic windows of opportunity for india if we go by the definition of united nation they have defined it that it is a period when the proportion of children aged less than 15 years fall below 30% and the proportion of older population fall below 15% of the population so if we take this definition of united nation and use medium variant fertility projection then we can find out that the effective window of opportunity for india is available for the period between 2011 and 2041 that means giving india roughly a 30 years of demographic bonus which is comparatively shorter than other countries and this phase is known as first demographic dividend because after that the, after 2041 the burdening uh, the aging burden will start rising even outpacing the child dependency ratio though it may provide the possibility of the second demographic dividend because we know that working age population if provided with gainful employment opportunities can lead to higher savings so as a result when they become older they are having some capital accumulation but again it depends on the availability of developed financial capital markets healthier older population provision of income security social security mechanism which at present seems to be a formidable task for india now 
what is the magnitude of the of this demographic dividend like we all say that we are having demographic dividend phase so what is that magnitude and what is the projected magnitude for the coming years so if we compare two scenarios one is demographic as usual scenario where we assume that same demographic uh, profile will follow like in the year 2001 combined with investment in socio economic policies to achieve your goal post of 2061 if you compare it with demographic emphasis scenario where the united nations medium variant fertility projection will be followed combined with the assumption of right socio economic policy environment in place by 2061 so if we make these strong assumption or if we assume that india will achieve the standards of developed countries like in terms of education health urbanization sectoral share employment then what is the magnitude of demographic dividend so we can see in the last column that favorable demographic changes combined with right socio-economic policy environment can lead to gdp per capita of over 1,65,000 rupees compared and if you compare the two scenario the difference is additional 43 percentage so this is based on the spectrum software where such projections have been made and this can be seen easily from this graph also like here the trend in the gdp per capita is shown over the years so we can see that over the years the gap between the two will increase if favorable demographic changes are combined with right socio-economic policy environment but here there is a clip as Devinda sir also pointed out that this demographic window of opportunity is not equivalent to demographic dividend there are many challenges at present there are many hurdles for reaping the realization of demographic dividend like for example there is a dwindling spending of education in the health sector though life expectancy has improved but the healthy health adjusted life expectancy hail in india is very low compared to other nations similarly the quality of governance is very low governance holds prominence because though health expenditure can be increased, but if the quality of governance is poor, it will not be channelized into the improvement of health indicators. Similarly, there are problems of skill mismatches, poor quality of learning, falling employment opportunities, worsening of the quality of employment, like due to growing informalization, casualization of jobs. And one important aspect is the status of women. There is a gloomy status of women in the sphere of education, health, skill, labor market, overall skewed sex ratio, high incidences of child marriage. So all of these combined with rising inequality in income, wealth, falling household savings rate, these are all the principal challenges which India has to tackle before realization of first demographic dividend. And one more important last challenge which needs to be kept in mind is that the age structure of India is now changing rapidly. There is a growing work older age population. Like if you compare the pace of aging in India with that of France, then you can find out that in India, it needs only 25 years to double the population of older age population. Compare it with the France that it takes 110 years. Now, such rapid pace of aging will be very problematic in the coming years. And this has to be kept in mind besides other challenges because it depends on the availability of developed financial market adequate provision of income and social security thank you with this i sum up my slides thank you very much dr neha now after looking dr. at the dr. potential dr. sorry sorry for interrupting but can i just ask a, a clarification from dr jain um if if you don't mind may i yes, yes. please sir um, Dr. Chen, uh, that is a very useful presentation. Thank you very much. But uh, your distinction between uh, dividend one and dividend two, meaning the two phases, is not entirely clear here. Uh, could you, you know, spell this out? Because 
in some ways, your dividend too seems to correspond to what Professor Kulkarni was pointing out uh, about you know the dividend continuing uh, in different states at, and uh, for for different time periods. Um, you know, going all the way up to 2061. So, so over to you, Dr. Zain. Okay, uh, so basically, first demographic dividend stage is where the working age share population is high relative to the dependent group. So mm. that is the period from 2011 to 2041 because mm. the dependency ratio is low. Mm. After 2041, India can have the possibility of second demographic dividend because they are the dependency burden will start rising and the working age population share will decline. And all of the empirical exercises have been done for the first demographic dividend. Only the last estimates of the projection basis were for the first and second demographic dividend. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now we come to the second uh, segment of our panel discussion. Looking after the potential or availability uh, uh, of the demographic dividend, where do we stand in terms of uh, employment, in terms of education, in terms of different kind of investment, and how we are located? How can we say that we are realizing the demographic dividend? And uh, here I will invite uh, Professor Jane Thomas uh, to share his views, uh, and then uh, we will hear uh, Professor Mehrotra. Uh, hi, uh, I hope, can I share my screen? Is that possible? I think I can. Yes, yes, please go. Yes. And is the screen visible now? Uh, perhaps. No, not now. Yes. Sorry, Jane. I'm trying to. You have to press share screen. That green yes. button, yeah. Yeah, yes, uh, I hope it is uh, clear. It is uh, yes. visible. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Arjun, and thank you, Devinta, uh, for inviting me. Uh, and thank you, Impri, for organizing this very important uh, question, uh, discussion on this very important question. Uh, much of it has already been discussed as uh, the previous speakers, but it's clearly uh, China and East Asian countries, as Professor Kulkarni also mentioned, uh, they actually managed to reap the potential of the demographic window of opportunities uh, in the 70s, 80s, and perhaps the 90s. It looks like India and other South Asian countries are not able to reap the demographic dividend. Uh, it, I mean, if you look at the, I mean, the potential that India has had, or probably the potential that India is missing, uh, Maybe this graph, uh, this is from partly from the World Bank and partly from the UN estimates. Uh, if you look at the increase in the 15 to 59 age population uh, during the 2010s, 2010 to 2020, India may have accounted for almost 27% of the entire increase in working age population in the world. So, uh, because this is the time now we know uh, China's uh, working age population is actually declined. Uh, it will continue to be one of the largest contributors to the working age population until 2040 or even 2050, as Professor Kulkarni's estimates show. So what must be done to reap the dividend? Uh, <clears throat> and we also seen that there are huge differences across Indian states. Uh, we have Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, uh, which are probably at a very early stage. Uh, 2011 and 2021, these are states in which the young population, the 15 to 29 population, increased by very large numbers, 13 million in UP, 9 million in Bihar. And I was actually estimating that the increase in the population of the young in these two states itself would be probably something close to 15 to 20 percent of the entire increase in the young population in the world, uh, you know, during these two decades, 2010s, 2020s. Whereas uh, Tamil Nadu or Kerala, their uh, young population have actually started declining uh, from 2011 onwards. So we need, 
And I, I think the point that I want to emphasize here is what are the kind of employment policies and what are the kind of industrial policies that we require to reap the dividend? Uh, clearly, uh, states such as Kerala and Tamil Nadu, they, they, they are in the danger of growing old before getting rich enough. You know? uh, whereas at the same time, Uttar Pradesh or Bihar, like we just now mentioned, uh, you know, they, are, they, they can actually be the most vibrant regions where uh, of global economic growth, not just uh, India's economic growth, because these are the places where you have a very large population of the young coming out. So what must be done? We also know that this is happening at a time uh, when there is an exit from agriculture, which has to happen uh, with development, uh, you know, being in disguised unemployment in agriculture is no longer an option, which also means that people have to come out of the villages, which also means the danger of open unemployment is going to increase. And the danger of open unemployment is going to increase. I'm not going to look into uh, some of these numbers, which I've discussed in many of the earlier presentations. Uh, but you know, I, I, the, the point I want to make here, perhaps I can just uh, point to one for, for a particular slide, which is that uh, while the increase in uh, in the port in the working age population is quite large, partly because of the increase in the working age population, also because of the exit of workers from agriculture. Uh, you have a very large uh, supply, a large potential supply of workers to the non-agricultural sectors, industry, construction, services. Uh, however, our employment creation has been very low. Uh, so between 2012 and 2018, I estimated that the potential supply, given this rate of increase in working age population, and given the rate of exit from agriculture, our non-agricultural workforce could have increased at the rate of 17.5 million every year. But the actual job creation was at the rate of 4.5 million a year. Uh, the, what I want to emphasize is that there is again a big regional divide in this. So uh, I hope this graph is clear. Uh, you, you have the the first set of the first set of columns. Uh, this is mainly for Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan, the less developed, economically less developed states in the north. They accounted, uh, you know, their share in population. Uh, in 2018 was 22.5, but their share in all workers was much less, and their share in better jobs, in, in services sector jobs, was only 14.3. Whereas for the southern states, uh, the share in employment and the share in better jobs, better quality jobs, much higher than the share in population. Uh, so the employment challenge is bigger for states with young population that and uh, the question of migration has already been flagged. Uh, so there's clear mismatch between the number of potential job seekers and actual employment created. So which is why we find this interstate migration of workers. And it's only going to get bigger. And we have seen uh, the last few days, uh, in fact, the last week, we saw uh, educated workers uh, raising their concerns. And again, that is going to increase uh, while <clears throat> because there is a growing demand for education in India. At the same time, no significant improvement in the quality of education. So there's a skill challenge that uh, India faces. If you look at the students as a proportion of population, total population, not just working age population, we find some very big numbers in 2018. Uh, Bihar is 32% of the entire population students, uh, or Uttaranchal, Uttar Pradesh is 30%. So we are going to see a very large numbers of people who have gone through educational institutions and looking for better jobs. So that is going to be the employment challenge, uh, which would mean that there is going to be competition between workers for the limited pool of jobs. So unless the size, unless the overall pool of employment we can increase, we're going to witness competition between migrants, local workers, women versus men, uh, and of course, greater vulnerability on the basis of religion, caste, and gender. 
and all of these are reducing the fact that there are so many workers competing for limited pool of employment reducing the bargaining strength of workers uh what should be the response of the state i already mentioned there should be an employment policy there should be an industrial policy uh but as of now the response of the state has not been to strengthen labor's position in many ways it has been to weaken labor's position some states have been making legislations to reserve jobs for local workers rather than increasing the overall number of jobs or they, it's only helps to increase the competition between workers and competition between states mostly for low wage jobs uh, you know uh, and uh, we, the ranking of states based on this so called ease of doing business a ranking which is based by the world bank largely based on the cheapness of land and labor <clears throat> again weakening the situation for labor as well as for uh, environment so what should be done to increase the size of employment so we should have a clear industrial policy uh, here we, we can learn much from the east asian countries Uh, i think we tend to think in india that low wages is enough to ensure success when it comes to labor intensive industries which is i think not correct there are several supply side challenges that india faces uh, starting with infrastructure bank credit skills we already mentioned but at the same time uh, we have seen low wages is a problem and low wages depress demand and constrain employment creation Uh, so there's a you know demand supply mismatch in the labor market in many different ways i mean because in our currently i mean kerala you see we have state where much of the employment comes from labor intensive industries like cashew coir traditional industries plywood uh, but increasingly we find there's a labor shortage in those traditional or labor intensive industries because uh, you know the local workers their aspirations are very high uh many of them are skilled or educated and uh, you find 1.5 million from kerala working as professionals in other parts of the world or at the same time you have around 2.5 million working in kerala uh, many of these are workers from other states so you clearly i mean in fact uh, professor kulkarni mentioned uh, migration i think a large part of migration is because of this mismatch in the labor market in fact two weeks back i was in ludhiana uh, uh where you have uh, engineering industry steel industry uh, garment workers many of them pay extremely low wages and many of the workers are migrants some of them long term migrants from uttar pradesh and bihar and i've seen some of the workers working for 12 hours in a day almost 6 days or 6.5 days in a week uh at very low wages something like 300 rupees per day for 12 hours of work and one one of the workers what one one of the workers said really uh you know i i thought was worth repeating here what he said he's a work is a uh, someone a worker from eastern uttar pradesh and he said you know there is lot of land in our place if some of these factories could be built in up at least we could have i mean we could have stayed with our families Uh, there's no reason why uh, punjab now a relatively high wage state should have many of those low wage industries uh, or industries which depend on uh, low wages mainly for competence so why not why can't we have uh, a different industrial structure uh, whereas if you if you if you think of a state like kerala it's high time that the state moves up uh, you know you cannot depend on traditional industries or labor intensive industries in a state which faces a labor shortage for all kinds of manual workers uh so it it probably needs to build a modern industrial structure knowledge industries uh it, you know state like kerala or even tamil nadu should not be competing uh, on low wages uh, in fact low wages for any state as as, as i already mentioned uh low wages just depress demand uh, i think for for uh our entire industrial policy country's industrial policy should move away from this dependence on low wages uh, at the same time i mean there are clear challenges for industrial policy uh, if you if you want to build knowledge intensive industries the investment requirements are very huge 
and it's difficult for many state states to actually begin with such investments but remember you know the requirements uh, different states require different types of industries different industrial structures require different industrial policies and each of these industrial policies require you know great amount of autonomy financial uh, and functional autonomy which at the moment we do not have in india so these are some of the challenges that we face uh, what should be the way forward clearly we need a much strengthened state uh, which has the capabilities to act in industrial policy not just the central government but also at the level of the state and one size does not fit all and that's something which we have to realize uh, while up can have more of garment industries and uh, you know food industries and leather industries which which depend on um, you know labor in very large quantities many other states should be moving away from labor intensive uh, in a way that has happened in east asian countries you know uh, as uh, you know um, initially you know the way uh, singapore or south korea or moved up the value chain whereas new newer entrants like you know labor intensive industries then moved to malaysia initially malaysia then indonesia and later of course to china which now has all the uh, industries all types of industries uh, i fully agree with many of the other uh, panelists that uh, the only way we can reap the demographic dividend uh, is to you know spend a lot so in addition to industrial policies we also need to have very strong social policies spending on health and education because uh, an educated workforce and better wages and better working conditions will provide the demand base because ultimately that is also important you have a situation of low wage low productivity industries is not going to help us we have to move into high productivity better uh, conditions for workers Uh, that is required for a larger economy and for more jobs uh, the revival of health and education sector in fact this is one area where we should invest not just uh, for reviving health and education but also for creating employment more teachers more nurses more doctors uh, many of them can be women i think i will end here because i know the time constraint uh so yes these are my largely po policy points uh, my my points that uh we have to act, act urgently employment policies industrial policies and social policies thank you so much thank you very much professor jain thomas uh now i'll invite professor narotra who has been dealing or grappling with this question of demographic dividend for quite some time uh several years back he wrote a book dedicated to this theme on demographic dividend and uh, later on also he has been continuously writing uh, uh overall what is the situation in india and also uh, specific cases of some states uh, professor mehrutra please thank you very much uh, indeed uh, professor devender singh and and excellent presentations by professor kulkarni dr neha jain and of course as usual my good friend uh, jain thomas and i'm really pleased that jain ca came before me it makes my life much easier i will come back to uh, very much to the uh, the requirements for a country to realize its demographic dividend that professor devendra singh uh, in 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 one of his slides pointed out in a minute and i will indeed uh, also come back to two very important points that uh, dr kulkarni made who said you know um who i think cautioned us very importantly that the uh, for brevity i'm going to call it the dd not the demographic dividend with you with your permission mr chair he's he cautioned us that the dd in india is going to be moderate unlike that in china the second way in which he cautioned us was that in many ways given the differential pace at which populations are growing in different parts of our country a smooth transition from north to south uh, would be absolutely critical and i will come back to this issue but let me actually um, focus a little bit on the fact that 
the dividend itself is likely to be uh, moderate in India as compared to China. But let's just see what the success of China was uh, during the period of its demographic dividend. What was the nature of its success? And I think very rightly, Jan has already pointed to that one, they pulled workers out of agriculture very rapidly because the economy grew from 1980 to 20, uh, for, for the next 30 years at something like nine to 10 percent per annum. And India has not achieved that kind of growth rate and certainly not that, that uh, consistency of a 30 year period of nine to 10 percent. Uh, the second big difference between China and India is the investments they made in health, education, and social transfers, a subject that I will come back to, and Jen has already pointed to that, and I will develop that a little bit further. And, uh, and, and, and because they generated jobs with their nine to 10% growth, that's the third difference, in the non-farm sector very rapidly, thereby raising uh, productivity across the economy because they focused on industry and manufacturing in particular. And, and I don't think it is sufficiently realized um, either among policymakers in our country or among academics that services may be fine as a, as a job provider, but by and large services generate relatively skilled jobs and our workers just don't have that profile. Meanwhile, manufacturing, if, if, we, if we had been focusing on labor intensive manufacturing, then it could generate jobs across the economy and then we could possibly move up the value chain ladder. Unfortunately, uh, as Jayan hinted, unfortunately, our labor intensive manufacturing has not been growing. And therefore, in fact, if it has been, it has actually been contracting in the last five to six years. So we shouldn't even begin to be comparing ourselves to China. And, and we must remind ourselves, what are Chinese leaders saying since 2015? Because their dividend gave over in 20, from around 2015. They have been saying, Europe became old after they became rich. We have become old without becoming rich. Now, please remember, these are the leaders of a country which have already, which started out at the same level of per capita income as, as India in 1979. But because they grew as fast as they did, reduced poverty at the rate at which they did, investment invested in health and education, they managed to increase their per capita income to a level four times ours today. So a very significant part of our dividend is already gone. And, you know, um, I'd, I'd like a further discussion after I've finished about, you know, this distinction that Dr. Jen uh, uh, made between the first phase of the dividend, which she said is ending by 2041, and the second phase, because I'm now going to turn very quickly to why I believe that we are facing a disaster and hardly a dividend at all. But before I turn to that issue, that concern, let me just say two other things that the Chinese leaders are pointing out, which should be red flags for all of us, especially for our po policymakers, who of course couldn't care less because they are, are one of our richest states is in the throes of a political crisis. That's, most, that's the most that they can think of on the Western coast of India. What are the Chinese leaders saying? You see, one of the, it, effects of an aging population, of the share of the waking age population, sorry, of the aging population rising about 10% of the population, which is, the, which is apparently what demo, demographers define as an aging population, 
uh, and China reached that around 2015 and their working age population is already begun. These two results, two facts. One, that when your aging population share rises rapidly above 10%, then you have to take into account their A, social security needs, and B, their rising health expenditure at a time when, when the elderly are, are living longer because life expectancy is improving because health, health uh, uh, status is improving over the years. And if the vast majority of the population doesn't have social security, a subject that I will come back to, and if our if the, if the health status of our elderly population is, is not robust, then we've got even further problems of dealing with elderly. I'll stop there as far as China is concerned. It should be an eye opener for us. Now, now let me re, re, uh, re, return to the, to the sort of five or six uh, preconditions for a country to realize its demographic dividend that Professor Devinder Singh rightly pointed out. And the point is that the dividend will be realized if and only if those five or six conditions are met. The first is, is already is jobs. Let's just, let me spend very briefly because Jain has already spoken about it. Just to say that at this current juncture and for some years now already, there are three groups of workers that are waiting to get into non-farm jobs. I emphasize this non-farm jobs because they, no one wants to be in agriculture. In any case, the meaning of structural transformation that should accompany uh, a, a demographic dividend is not just rising per capita income, but also a rise in the share of industry and services in total GDP and a, a fall in the share of agriculture and a rise in the share of industry and services in employment and a fall in the share of agriculture. Now, um, what are we seeing in our country? In the last few years, we've actually, uh, you know, from two, until 2004 or five, the absolute number of workers in agriculture was still rising. Or in other words, for 50 years, the absolute number of workers in agriculture was still rising, although the share of workers in agriculture was falling which shows how slow the structural transformation process was, despite the fact that we were already in the early phases of our demographic dividend. And that process went on till 2019 and that process has been reversed. It has stalled, it has been aborted and the, uh, and, 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 uh, the manufacturing employment has actually falling. Manufacturing share of employment is falling in the last four or five years. And the share of agriculture in the last two years has actually risen and risen very sharply, re resulting in a reversal. So who are the three groups that are looking for non-farm jobs? One are those who, are, who were in agriculture and find that there is too much rural distress and want to leave agriculture. The parents want to leave, so young who are getting better educated, they're looking for work. And please, rem just to remind yourselves, um, of the numbers. Between 2004, 5, and 12, we were generating, actually between 2000 and 2012, we were generating seven and a half million no, new non-farm jobs every year. And the economy was growing at 8% per annum by and large. After 2013, the, the number of non-farm jobs that the economy is generating is only 2.9 million per annum. A drop from 7.5 million to 40% of that level of 2.9 million per annum all the way till 2019. And since then, it's the situation has even worsened. So that's one group who are, who move on to move out of agriculture. That's that need to be given non-farm jobs. The second group is the following that are, are those who have who are in the uh, who belong to the stock of unemployed the first group also belong to the to the, to the stock of workers who who need and if we are to realize our demographic dividend must must get non farm jobs this second group consists of the unemployed their number by the usual status in 2012 was only 10 million because we were generating non new non farm jobs at a very rapid rate 
that number already on account of the declining growth rate and the and the and 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 the worsening of the pattern of growth which i've hinted at just now actually increased the absolute number of openly unemployed increased from 10 million to 30 million by 2019 and that number has increased by additional 7 or 8 million in the last two years that's the second group of people who need non farm jobs the third group and i have you can see i've not even mentioned the youth that jain was speaking about the the, the young people who so called people who want who who are joining the working age the dividend they are they have been joining at the rate of about 5 to 6 million from uh from the last 6 or 7 years and their number is only going to go on rising which means at a very minimum we should be generating no, about about 10 to 12 million non farm jobs and and higher than that uh as we move along this uh, this decade right now we should be generating 10 and a half 10 to 12 million and we are as i told you we were generating 2.9 so the, so i've mentioned two sources of the rising stock of those who need non farm jobs and now i've just mentioned this rising flow of young people who are joining the working age thanks to the dividend and this is the situation on jobs and one of the main reasons and i won't say very much i mean the second uh, condition that uh, professor devendra singh pointed out was a high performing economy well let's just look at the trajectory in respect of the of the performance of the economy from independence 1950 to 1980 we were the economy was growing at 3.5% per annum but our population was growing at an accelerating pace with every decennial census between 51 and 81 and reached a peak of about 2.6% per annum at a time that means on average the the average between 50 and 80 of the population growth rate is about 2.5% per annum while the why the gdp growth rate is only 3.5% per annum that means per capita income was growing at barely 1% per annum so the a mass of uh, a mass of stock of poor people had already accumulated by the late 70s and although we had begun to enter our dividend from the early 80s onwards the the important and interesting point is that we do see a rise in the savings rate from the early 80s onwards and slow very slow rise in the investment rate and a rise in the gdp growth rate in the 80s it had gone up to 5.4% per annum the population growth rate had begun to decelerate so we began to see a uh, per capita income growth faster than we had seen in the first 30 years after independence in other words uh, not one but at least you know 2.5 to 3% per annum in the 90s that picked up again by additional percentage point to about 6.4% per annum but then this in this century we've seen much much faster growth rate trouble is since about 15 2015 16 the growth rate has decelerated and decelerated extremely sharply very quickly and that's the worrying fact about and the reason why jobs are not growing so rapidly quickly now turning to to the factor of health you know it's already been pointed out by jen but one thing that we need to recall is that health is impacted by nutritional levels of children and believe it or not we still are at a country where 35% of our of our young under the age of 5 is stunted this is higher than in africa i i wonder how many you know what proportion of our policy makers are even aware of this and what proportion of our intelligentsia is even aware of this fact and secondly health health status is impacted by safe sanitation before swachh bharat began 
you know, 60% of the global population that, that defecated in the open lived in India. We account for only 17% of the world's population. 60%. That 60% that share has certainly dropped because of the number of toilets that have been built. But has behavior changed commensurately? No. So we've got two social determinants of health which are very much going against our demographic, our realizing our demographic dividend. I won't say more than this because I've already taken about 17 and a half minutes. I'll finish in the next three or four minutes. Second, education. That gives us some ground for some degree of confidence because we, are, we did manage in, in, in the last 20 years to increase uh, elementary education enrollment rates, though not learning levels. That's a very serious problem. I don't have to tell you that. We did manage to increase secondary enrollment rates between 2010 and 2015 because of the upward pressure coming from the elementary education enrollment, uh, secondary education for 15 to 16 year olds for classes nine and 10 went up from 20, uh, from, from 58% to 80, 85% with gender parity, which is wonderful news, which is one reason why our, uh, our population growth rate, even in the Northern states, the Hindi belt has been declining and declining quite fast. However, we know what the learning levels are. We know that the higher education system and even the secondary, higher secondary system is turning out unemployables. Now let me turn to the third prerequisite that of Professor Davindra Singh said, skills. For 10 years, after, you know, after 50 years of neglecting to, to technical and vocational education, 10 years ago, around 2010 or so, the government became, became serious about technical and vocational education. What is the status today? You look at the latest NSS data, less than 5% of our workforce, of our, of our, of our relevant, relevant age, the work, workers are, have any voc formal vocational training. Less than five. Compare that to 85% in China and 90% 90, 90 in South Korea. And we are talking about realizing the demographic dividend and competing with China. I, we must be living in a fool, completely fool's paradise. That means that our, our skill development programs are completely off mark. Just one more sentence about that, that the government's approach is supply driven, not demand driven. The government's approach is government will manage finance and, and, and deliver the, the, the vocational education. When in fact, the world over the experiences that wherever it has delivered well and has skilled people to, to, to prepare them for jobs are, are, are countries where it is industry, employer-driven, and it's demand-driven. And finally, I will close with the pension issue. 91% of our, of our workforce is informal. That means they have no social insurance. That is today, and that is when we are less than 20 years away for the critical phase of, our, of the first phase of our dividend to end. I don't take the second phase of our dividend very seriously. I'd like to be challenged on that, on that statement. But the first phase is what is the most critical one. Uh, and unfortunately, um, we, 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 have, we made no progress in the last 15 to 20 years on ensuring pensions for our, for our population. I have a whole paper which proposes how it can be done, but if only someone was listening. And finally, let me go back to what Professor Kulkarni warned us about. As it is, he's warned us that our dividend is going to be moderate. If you, if, if, if you are to believe what I have argued, I'm suggesting that if any, if, if I, we were to think of a threefold classification of mild, moderate, and, and, and uh, very, very good, then I would say our dividend is likely to be mild at best, unless we get our policies right. And the final point, this smooth transition from north to south of, of workers, I don't, we are getting to the point of breaking, breaking point. What do I mean by that? The, because the 
the northern Hindi Belt states are simply not generating the jobs. I could argue, I could you know give you evidence on that, but I, I've run out of time. And they are growing much more slowly. I have a separate paper in EPW, uh, September 2021, where I essentially I argue on theoretical grounds and also on you know on econometric grounds. Essentially, the following: Why human development should precede economic growth in our states? Um, essentially, two sentences. I'm arguing that in the southern and the western states of India, they've managed to grow between between 1992 and 2018 at over 7% per annum. But the northern and the eastern states have grown at five or less than 5% per annum. And the reason why this is the case, I argue, is because the southern and the western ones, relative to the northern and the, uh, eastern ones, invested in human development, human capital, and um, I try and demonstrate this both theoretically as well as econometrically. So the, as the Southern states generate fewer and fewer jobs as they transition to more capital intensive industry, uh, the likelihood of their generating that many jobs is not going to be that great. In which case, we are in a serious bind because they will stop absorbing workers that Professor Kolkadni is hoping they will continue to absorb. And, this, and the Northern states will simply not get their governance right or their human capital policies right or their industry policies right. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, sir. We have lots of ideas. Uh, I, to start with, we have some questions from the, uh, the audience also, but I'll start. I have two questions. One on the first segment, asking uh, Professor Kulkarni and Dr. Neha. In the recent National Family Health Survey, it has shown that the fertility has gone down very drastically, and it looks like it's going to reduce uh, way faster than what uh, different projections had shown earlier. Will it have any impact on the uh, uh, duration, uh, availability and duration of the demographic dividend and also on its peak, would the duration will be smaller and peak could be higher? Sir. Uh, thank you, Devendra. And was happy to listen to Professor Mehrotra. The more, more comprehensive, I entirely agree with the points basically. Uh, but uh, specifically coming to the point that you raised, actually, uh, the decline in fertility has been there. It has been continuing. It has not been very drastic in the last few years or so. It has continuing smoothly. And it is what it was expected to be broadly. In fact, NFHS is only one of the sources. We normally use the sample registration system as a continuous because it gives continuous figures. And that also gave a total fertility rate of 2.15 or so by 2017. And that means about 2 or 2.1. So it is not that fertility decline has been much more than what we had expected or what was projected. It is more or less on the same lines. Uh, it could be rapid provided the one child family becomes much more common in India than what it has been. It, has be, it is becoming common in West Bengal. The total fertility has declined. If other states go that way in a large, on a large scale, then fertility decline could be even steeper than what has been projected. But otherwise, the fertility decline seen is more or less on the projected lines. And therefore, broader changes would more or less be on the projected lines whether the projections are by the United Nations, by the Registrar General's Office or the technical group or independent projections of various persons. There was some projection in Lancet, which gave even a lower figure, but that was one of the alternate projections. So broadly, we don't expect fertility to decline very drastically, or, or sorry, that it has declined so drastically. So broadly, the age structure projected changes would remain unless we see some great changes in the next few years, unless we see a steep fall in say Uttar Pradesh or Bihar particularly, which is not forthcoming. Even there, the projections expect that they will reach 
a low fertility by 2030 or 35. But because there has been a lag, the growth there will continue much longer than other states. Other states will basically reach a peak population in 2040s, many of the leading states, whereas Bihar and Uttar Pradesh will continue up to 2070 onwards. But broadly, that is what we see now. And unless there is a drastic, there is a crash in fertility, we don't expect any changes. Thank you. And Dr. Nea, you also agree that uh, your model and projection which you have done will hold uh, in this scenario. Uh, actually, yes, it depends on the replacement level fertility rate. Like if we see the fertility trend over the years, then in the year 2020, India had already attained the replacement level fertility of 2.1 children per woman. And in near future, if we assume that same trend will continue, then the model will hold. But if, if yes, it goes below the replacement fertility rate, then India will not be able to attain its position in realization of dividend. Some are saying it has already gone down replacement level. Yes, yes, it has already gone down. So in one of our papers, like if I share my screen, Uh, we are they have uh, we have calculated the cost revenue ratios like and if we take different types of total fertility rate and if we take like 1.8 1.4 1.6 so there we have estimated that what is the cost revenue ratio of these total fertility rate projection for india and going below for like 1.6 and 1.4 is not idealistic situation yeah uh, we i'm um, in discussion with the uh, uh, Professor Goli, to make presentation on these papers. Yes. Uh, these are very important uh, two, three papers which we had developed at the time. So uh, we'll discuss later uh, in some other panel discussion, uh, these papers. Uh, Professor Merotra and Jain, uh, could we say that there is hardly any hope of any demographic dividend in India, uh, especially seeing uh, what kind of policies we have been focusing in last 10 to like 10 years or so, uh, jobless growth, uh, uh, decreasing net investment on education and health. Uh, uh, because of the COVID, we are, because of other policy major, measures, uh, we squandering the progress we had made on uh, health uh, indicators as well as the people who had come out of the poverty. They have, like we are getting the figures that almost the same people, 220 million who had escaped the poverty are again back into the like, classes of poverty. So can we say that it's high time that we stopped talking of uh, demographic dividend prospects in India Rather, we start focusing on what could be the uh, uh, pitfalls because we have not uh, uh, realized this opportunity and there could be severe social and economic cost to India because of our negligence are not paying heed uh, what should have been done. Dr. Jain, do you want to go first? I, I'll continue. Yeah, maybe I will make a few quick comments. Uh, thank you, Devender, for that. Uh, I think, again, uh, I probably want to emphasize on the East Station uh, experience a lot more uh, you now. Uh, what they have done, I mean, like Professor Mehrotha already mentioned, 1950s, we began at similar levels. Uh, be it South Korea, be it China, all of us, except Japan, of course, which was at much higher level. Even until 1990, China and India were at similar levels in terms of per capita income. But the way East Asian countries are forged ahead in the over the last uh, five decades or so, I think it has to do one with you know huge investment in human capital, education, health. Of course, they also started with lower inequality, land reforms in all of these East Asian countries, uh, be it Japan, be it South Korea, be it China, in different political regimes. Inequality was much less, investments in health and education. And then the crucial thing in economy, 
they started with low wage industries advantage in low wage but that was only for a very short while they moved up the value chain wages increase living conditions improve and industrial structure there was a huge transition in industrial structure from labor intensive to skill intensive to technology intensive to knowledge intensive i mean india is in every single way india could have done this now can we do i mean we started at similar levels we probably had in 1950s a more ambitious industrialization program than uh, probably any of the other east asian countries uh, we have a very large technologically uh, we still i mean despite all the drawbacks uh, we still have a base i think i mean hope is not lost obviously an opportunity has been missed the last 20 30 years we could have had been much ahead of what we are today now but i think rather than you know worrying about what has been missed i think uh, high time that we we start the action education health leave away all this low wage i mean i think we have this obsession with low wage industries low wages low wages as the salvation to economic growth no i think that is uh, something which our policy makers and our firms also have to understand uh and yes uh we you know like i mentioned i mean why should there be uh you know i have, you know in fact me uh, you know this mismatches in labor market migration due to mismatches in labor market should be avoided uh, migration should be there migration helps but uh, if it is on account of a mismatch in labor market if uh, i mean why not now uh, up can have uh, up should start industrialization which focus on labor intensive industries and it cannot come just by uh, it has to it, there has to be a policy there has to be industrial policies which focus on building those industries uh, whereas a punjab or a tamil nadu or kerala should move out uh, there should be an industrial upgrading uh, you know those so that you know workers can find employment Uh, so i think uh, yes uh, yes we have missed a lot of opportunities but we should act quickly that's my point professor mehrutra um professor devendra singh you've touched a very raw nerve i <laughs> wait wait to begin and wait to end yeah well 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 i should say that there we were on a trajectory of i would argue inclusive growth from about 2003 4 to about 2012 for about a nine year period unfortunately the previous government went into policy paralysis in its last two years and for, but regardless because macroeconomic policies had still been reasonably re, you know stable despite the fact that the global economic crisis stimulus was retained for way too long by the previous government which led to inflation and led to led to the accumulation of debt the fact remains that over the period 2004 to 14 we grew at 8% per annum and that's when i am saying we were generating 7 and a half million new non farm jobs and not the number of workers in agriculture was dropping that means we have demonstrated the potential professor singh we have domain them so we must not lose hope we can only continue to argue i, I mean the time is limited otherwise i could have explained why i believe that there was uh, there was an inclusiveness to the growth strategy that was being adopted by the previous government if that had not been the case the absolute number of the poor which had never fallen in the history of our country uh, until 2004 fell by fell by 140 million nearly in a matter of 7 years uh, uh, that's what happened thanks to good econo- relatively good economic policy i would i'm still very critical of the fact that they didn't come up with an industrial policy which was labor intense which was focused on labor intensive manufacturing uh, i still very critical of the fact that they did not understand the nature of the critique that people 
like me were making about their skill policies. Uh, because I was actually in the planning commission. I wrote the 12th plan chapter on skill development. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the 12th plan chapter itself, I mean, the 12th plan was coming into effect only by 2012. And then the government, you know, um, went into policy paralysis. But the bottom, this government, unfortunately, has not understood the ABC of skilling and vocational training. And that's why you're getting a lot of mismatch, not just because of the poor learning. Now, um, am I uh, losing hope? Yes, I'm losing hope that I don't expect any, any further change in the next two years for the, following re for the following reason, that I have seen evidence in the last five years of macroeconomic policy being, policies being adopted which run counter to what would what would be taught by you and me in macroeconomic uh, macroeconomics 101 to our undergraduates or postgraduates quite literally in a in a crisis of demand where aggregate demand has collapsed there is not a country in the world which has been raising taxes this government has been raising taxes so no i have no hope of this government left any longer None whatsoever. However, if it gets re-elected, then we literally have lost another five years of our dividend. And these are very precious years. So I'm, I'm, and that's why I want to hear from Dr. Jen next about what she thinks, why she thinks that there's a serious potential of a dividend post 2041. Uh, what is this second stage? I'm not so confident uh, at at all, uh, so so I, I let me pause here because um, I want to listen to others. Uh, I could give you more reasons why I I have I have very little hope over the next few years, and if it if this government is coming back in twenty twenty four, the the current disaster and slow growth and no job create practically no job creation. And, and rising poverty is, is likely to survive. I mean, this government is say, telling us poverty is falling. The, the executive director of India in the IMF is telling us poverty fell. Who would believe that is so counterintuitive? That's why I've sort of, you know, undercut the methodological foundations of what they've argued. But you know that's that's for another discussion. Maybe he confused between poverty and poor. Hmm. <laughs> so, Dr. Neha, you want to respond to uh, Professor yeah. Merutra that you uh, want to change the input in your regression model? <laughs> no, sir. Actually, what happened that basically those are the projections assuming right socio-economic policy environment for India. Like these are based on some assumptions, like following the trend which the developed countries are already experiencing. If India would have done that, then what would have been the demographic dividend? So basically, instead of that potential demographic dividend, we can say if we are not able to follow that right socioeconomic policy environment, like in terms of good quality education, skill, health, employment, urbanization, sectoral share, financial literacy, skill mismatches, everything. If that is not in place, then that is actually representing a demographic loss. That difference is representing demographic loss. And after 2041, that is the realization of second demographic dividend. It is again dependent on the availability of developed financial capital market, provision of income security, social security, which at present is a formidable task in India. So that is this paper where the projections have been made, where the estimates are made for magnitude and duration of demographic dividend is based on the reality we can say is actually representing the losses which we are going to accrue in near future if we do not have the right socioeconomic policy environment in place. So my Thank arguments you. are also in line with Professor Santosh Merotra. <laughs> like, yes, yes. yes. And that's why I say, said you want to change the input in your regression model. 
the real, real policies or programs which are taking place. There is one question from uh, one of the participants here, from uh, Sudha Chandranji. She is saying because of the uh, past success, is China better placed uh, to take care of uh, its elderly population? And uh, I would like to add, uh, although it has been highlighted uh, uh, in the presentation, how big that problem will be for India? <laughs> Uh, vis -a -vis, like how China is managing and how are we are we on right track or path we are thinking about the uh, the elderly population in in, in India anyone uh, all the panelists please. let me come up, let me come in on this if, if I may because I've actually written on this uh, for some years and I have a whole design available for what a social insurance uh, uh, architecture for India uh, could be, and it's not expensive. Uh, my estimate is that we can actually uh, ensure a growing share of our informal workforce, which is, as I said, 91% of the workforce, they have no pensions, they have no death and disability insurance and no practically no maternity benefit. We can in, uh, assure this, uh, at 0.61% of GDP per annum. And that's a little bit more than what we spend on Mandrega. Obviously, we can't stop spending on Mandrega if we are not, particularly if we're not generating, you know, non-farm jobs. But 0.61 is what, so I, my uh, plan or uh, an architecture and cost estimate suggests that we can achieve social security for our population in the next 10 years, all 91% of, of them. And second, I, I, I mean, we will obviously have to increase our allocation to education. You know, 3% of GDP is simply <laughs> won't cut any ice. Now, 1.3% uh, uh, of GDP on health by the, by the state and central governments taken together is not going to uh, help us achieve our demographic dividend. But this government, you know, about 40, 30 to 40%, 35% of total health expenditure in our country is undertaken by the central government. The remain, remaining public spending is undertaken by the state government. So the state spending, state spending is almost entirely on salaries and wages. Now, a, a fair bit of the uh, investment in health come, can come from the center. But in a once in a century pandemic, Professor Singh, in FY21, the budget allocation for health was 86,000 crores by the central government. In FY22, the same 86,000 crores. And in FY23, the most recent budget, again, the same 86,000 crores. In other words, in real terms, it was actually declining, and we are talking about a, the COVID period. And this is this by a government which came out in January 2017 with a national health policy. I mean, there, which where the objective was, we will achieve 2.5 percent of GDP on of government expenditure on health by 2025. A COVID pandemic, once in a century, would have should have brought the government should have made the government realize that we have to bring the 2025 target forward. We should try and achieve it by FY23. What I'm telling you is the exact opposite is happening. Now you appreciate why I'm, I'm so pessimistic. If the, if the economy is slowing or contracts by more than two and a half times the world economy contracts in, in FY21, the first year of COVID, you know, the world economy contracted 3.1% of GDP, 3.1%, uh, uh, sorry, ours contracted by 6.6%. So naturally, the government doesn't have the fiscal space. Then on top of all this, it has already, you know, cut corporate taxes, cut personal income taxes, eliminated wealth tax. Where is the revenue going to come from? You know, where is macroeconomics 101? You are increasing taxes in a time of, you know, aggregate demand collapsing and joblessness growing and poverty increasing. They keep telling us, oh, poverty is poverty is uh, falling. And we are generating so many jobs. Look at the EPFO numbers. 
which is the, which are rubbish numbers as jain will also attest yeah spending on health sectors especially was a big concern and we organized a panel discussion and the title i had kept on pandemic budget in pandemic times Correct. is there was no relation or no recognition of no. what people no. are going Professor Singh, if you don't mind, I, I would like to sort of ask uh, Professor Kulkarni a question. Yeah. Uh, if I may. Professor Kulkarni, you are still there, right? I'm here. Very much here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, first of all, a great pleasure meeting you finally. Um, um, my, uh, my question is, I, I'd like to understand from you um, uh, what you mean by the dividend being moderate in the case of India versus China? I mean, the graphs, of course, show something. I appreciate that. But I'm trying to understand this conceptually. Uh, well, the way I looked at it is how low is the dependent ratio? Mm. Because after all, dividend comes because the depend dependency ratio is low. Mm. And how low is it? And in the case of China, it goes really much below that what I consider cutoff. The cutoff can change. That's immaterial. You know, one can use different cutoffs. But in terms of percentages, it goes much lower than India. India never reaches that level of low. So that peak of dividend in China is very, very large. And that's a great advantage. It could be disadvantage if one cannot provide employment. It will really, you know, cause unemployment. I don't know. I once kind of speculated that Tiananmen issue was probably because a lot of young people in the job market were not getting jobs at that time. Whatever. I mean, that's a different matter. I can show it uh, analytically, but that was, as I said, speculation. But essential point is, uh, as I showed in the graph, it goes very, very low dependency ratio. And that means you have, you are in a much more favorable position as far as a dependency burden is concerned. This analysis, what, yes. this analysis that you've done, sir, could you share it? Uh, if, if yes, sir. Ah. Actually, I'm sorry, it is rather dated now. This was a thing I did for UNFP in 2017. No, it's okay. I mean, it's I, okay. I mean, projections yeah, will but change slightly now. I'll really appreciate broadly, that. Yeah, broadly. I, I uh, sent my is, email address. Yeah. I, 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 noted, I noted it. I will ah. mail it to you. But I'll what do you think, if I might just ask, what do you think of uh, Neha's? Yes. Uh, uh, suggestion and I felt mm. that you, that that in your presentation you were saying something similar about this second phase of the div of the dividend. Uh, well, actually, I <laughs> I said second phase is something that I don't want to get into because that is, I am not an economist. That is basically economic. Whereas the first dividend, what is it is essentially direct demographic the opportunity because the demographic process of fertility decline leads to a demographic change that is changing age distribution which creates a favorable condition if one can utilize it the second one comes out of savings savings in the first dividend and those savings and investments would help you the second dividend so that is what i said that is not my area of understanding and knowledge it is basically economist domain so i didn't want to get into that but I just dealt with the first part, which is essentially demographic. Because it tends, I mean, for me, what worries me is that many members of the intelligence and more importantly, policymakers mm -hmm. seem to be under this illusion that our dividend is going to last for decades and decades just now. Yeah. Which uh, it's a view that I cannot subscribe to. I mean, I genuinely don't believe. That if, if, well, I genuinely believe that if your age, you know, aging share of the population is rising rapidly above the 10% cutoff, yes. we are already, if we are to believe the Ministry of Health projections up to 2036, you recall, or, um, yes. Yes. that they're already saying we are at 14% for over 60 year olds. That means That's it's all, and that projection was done some years ago. So that means we are already getting to. You know, serious, seriously high levels mm -hmm. of uh, elderly who who have to be who have to have access to social security yeah. and increasing health health requirements. Uh, as far as that is concerned, 
Actually, I have figures for 65 plus rather than 60 plus because that is broadly the UN life expectancy. Wala you, baat jo aapki hai, hai. Yeah, yeah, UN Aray. system, Aray. and Aray. that will cross 10 percent just around 2040. So until that, exactly. So well, I I go That's with what you're saying also. basically that the share of elderly is not going to rise phenomenally hmm. for the next 20. It, it, it is rising. It has Absolutely been rising, right. but it is a small increase. Correct. And providing for that is not going to be a major issue. For some time, ah, and it will double from. I mean, if I recall the numbers, yeah. it'll that share will double by about 2036 from 100 20. million now to yeah. uh, 200 million by then. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the share of 65 plus will increase from about five percent at the beginning of the century to about 10 percent by 2038 40. Ah, there you go. Very good. Whereas at the end of the century, it will go to 20 percent. Mm. It is that's too far to project, but yeah, whatever yeah. everyone projects it, but now UN is projecting up to end of the century. So mm. it's ah. up re, for the next few years, it is not going to be a big jump, it is not going to be a big burden, though we one must be aware of that. And incidentally, talk about aging started even before talk about dividend. You know, even in 1980s, 90s, we were talking about aging. Mm -hmm. Aging was foreseen much before mm -hmm. dividend was identified and recognized. So that has been there. So there ought to be policies and it is not going to be very difficult if there is a will to support this population. Mm -hmm. It is not going to be suddenly huge burden falling on you. It's very, very small increase and one can provide much better security, much better pensions than the pitiable pensions that are being provided now. Except that the challenge is much greater on account of the fact that climate change is really upon us. And, you know, in a way that China didn't face it, although it's facing it now, but we are already facing the effects of it. Uh, yeah. So, if not any more burning statement are issued by the panelists, I would like to share my last slide. This is the conclusion slide. Is that okay? Of course, please, please do. So, on based on the discussion and my own reading and understanding, I am of the view that there has been poor preparation and the floundering realization of the demographic dividend in India. There has been low focus on investment in education and health, which was highlighted by the panelists. And poor learning outcomes, although uh, Professor Mathras uh, uh, shared that uh, enrollment has increased, but the learning outcomes at school and uh, level at later, they, they are uh, worrisome. Skills building, again, as Professor Mehrotra highlighted, that less than 5% has have, have had any uh, vocational uh, training, which is uh, uh, woefully in it, inadequate to realize the demographic dividend. Jobless growth, it, this is the term which is going on, record and un unemployment, especially for the young people. And uh, workforce participation rate for women, like we, we cannot even, we don't know why it is so low. Niti Aayog has been grappling with this issue, how to calculate it, how to, um, whether it is correct or not. UN agencies, they asked the uh, UN agencies to look into it, but from 26% it came to 23% and now it's in single digits. So a really problematic situation there. Vulnerable old population, its number is going to rise. Maybe the share or proportion may not be that high, but suddenly from 1.4 million to going to uh, uh, 200 million uh, within 10, 15 years, that's going to be a large number of people. And especially what Professor Narodra was saying, that most of the people who are uh, becoming old are people who have worked in the informal sector with no social security, no health security, uh, no health program to look after. Mostly they are there family and family assets to look after. So uh, really uh, uh, concern, uh, big concern there. And mi migration, whatever evidence is there, it's a low quality migration. There is shift of rural poverty to urban po poverty. 
There's these people, they are just uh, moving from a, a distress agriculture sector to find whatever job they can find in urban areas. Their living and working conditions uh, have been well documented. There is no urgency in the high focus states like the calculation which Professor Kulkarni was mentioning he did for uh, UNFPA when I was working with the UNFPA. Like 628 million population growth of the total, more 100 million will be only in six North Indian states and UP and Bihar only like 270 million. So what kind of policies and programs are there to for education, health, and to realize the demographic dividend. So at best, what I can visualize is that they, we will be have a limited skewed demographic dividend of the overall, the moderate demographic dividend, which we have the potential for, and it will be upper middle, middle class, urban young people who are healthier, better educated, and may be able to corner high quality jobs in India abroad. A very limited and skewed kind of whatever policies, the skewed policies we have now. So that is my uh, kind of conclusion. And I invite um, Arjun and uh, to, to give a, um, a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. So to formally give the vote of thanks, now invite Zubia. As we come to the end of this extremely enlightening discussion, I, Zubia, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, would like to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the IMPRI Center for Human Dignity and Development. We'd like to express our gratitude to the panelists for today's discussion, Professor Jayan Josh Thomas, Dr. Neha Jain, Professor P.M. Kulkarni, Professor Santosh Mehrotra for adding your diverse perspectives and valuable insights to the discussion. We are also grateful to Mr. Devender Singh sir for moderating and leading the discussion. And of course, we thank all our participants here on Zoom or on Facebook Live for participating and raising pertinent questions. We are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our various podcasts. I hope that you continue to tune in future to our population and development series and in brief hashtag web policy talk. Thank you once again and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.